Welcome, listeners. I am Shihan Ron Layton, and I am honored to have as our very special guest today, Hanshi Carl Wilcox. Hanshi Wilcox, welcome to this episode of the Kwan Mu Monologue. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So one of the things that we try to do is we try to preserve the lived experiences of the guests, and we go through a series of questions to get better insight into who you are, what drives you, what your experiences uh, were in the martial arts over the years. And we're gonna just have a conversation about that. And so um, with that, uh, let's do a little introduction here. And so um, who, who are you and what do you do? And if you're retired, what, what did you do? I'm Carl D. Wilcox, Hanchi, 10th down in Karate Do, 9th down in Jiu Jitsu, 8th down in Cobra Do. I've been a practitioner. Initially, my first experience started in 1957. I've run my own martial arts schools in Oklahoma, Florida, and Cal uh, North Carolina. We started off in an all small school in North Carolina and evolved into a 6,000 square foot international training center. My career was built around the media. Okay. I have uh, been, the media being the Palm Beach Post Times, the Orlando Sentinel, the Cleveland Plain Dealer, the Ventura Star Free Press, Freedom Newspapers, and ABC Television. That I did as a purpose to move forward in my learning of martial arts. I also, my education, I went to school in Florida. I went to three different schools in California, universities, and I got my PhD in philosophy. So one of the things that we've talked about on the Kwan Mu monologue is that we are not simply martial arts, own martial artists simply in the dojo. What we do in the dojo has an influence of what we are outside of the dojo. So you talked about all of those things that you did and moving from this city to that city. How, how did martial arts influence your outside life? My outside life was influenced due to the fact in traveling to these various locations, I was seeking knowledge within the arts where the instructors were so I could gain different perspectives and not be restricted just to one way of thinking. That's also affected me in my business operations as far as working for various companies, is that I would not be restricted, okay, high, on one singular idea. So working, working in marketing research and advertising, I was able to deal with clientels that had different ideas for their products that needed to be marketed in a different way. And that helped me being diversified from teacher to teacher to do that very thing. So what's really interesting to me is that if a student starts off in a certain system, let's say you start off and you, you know you pick a system in, in Shotokan or a Japanese art. As, as we know, there are different ways of doing things in the martial arts. And, and you may have another martial arts that martial, another martial art that you study that in some way seems in contradiction to what you learned in the first thing that you studied. So how are you able to reconcile in your quest for learning? How are you able to reconcile different arts that may, at least on the face of it, seem like that they're actually trying to do things in different ways? How, how did you do that? Well, I got one way to state is that there's over 47 different ways to get to the top of the mountain, okay? but you take different paths to get there. What we would do, or what I would do, is take the foundation that I had, which is similar to most martial arts styles, okay? We're dealing with the centering, the horror, the breathing, and not everything that would work for me or for you would work for me. It would work, but not sufficiently and I could only move forward so far with that information, technically and tactically. Philosophically, there would be some differences. 
and we'd have to come to an understanding that it's okay for a difference to make a difference because there has to be a difference for that to occur. Now, in the process is that I might find through observation or as a guest that there are certain things taking place that fit more into my physical posture and my intellect at the time. And that I've outgrown certain areas, both technically and emotionally and psychologically. And I need to transfer and find a way to see that those will integrate together properly. So you've talked uh, uh, interestingly about your, your martial arts uh, history and the different kinds of uh, things that you've done. Can you give the listeners an idea of what are some of your favorite martial arts experiences? I think my first exciting moment in the martial arts is when I evolved to a point where I could kumite. That was probably brought great joy to me because I loved the physical contact, I loved the exchange, I loved the concept of the strategies that you have to use in contradiction to the very person that had skills that you had to find ways to overcome to achieve success. Okay, so it's interesting in the way that you phrased that. You said evolved to the point where you could do an experience and I'm sure be very good at Kumite. But I wanna concentrate for just a moment on, on this whole notion of evolving in the martial arts. What's, what does that mean? Evolving must, it has, to, has to be a intellectual and psychological process as well as a physical and technical process that correspond simultaneously, okay? One may lag behind the other and then you have to catch up, but those have to blend together in the process. So involving allows me to go to a higher level of understanding and the ability to perform the tasks at hand. If it be a front kick, a side kick, round kick, hook kick, reverse punch, you know, what am I going to be most successful at? But that's where the evolving comes in because in tournament, uh, which I've fought in, okay, and I've been successful when I wanted to be successful. And there's a difference. I've gone out and been two points ahead of top fighters. And then I decided, here's an opportunity for me to expand my experience and possibly evolve from all the training with this technique I've never done in tournament and make the effort of trying to do it, failing the first time with it failing the second time with it, failing the third time with it, and losing the match because of that. But I evolved because I learned it doesn't apply in that situation. Is it going to be something that I can use on the street, or is it just for the game that I was learning at that time? You know, it's fascinating that you could do that inside of the competition and, and make those kinds of decisions while you were, in fact, competing. Well... How do you evolve and, and, unless you look at yourself and say, how do I grow? Do I repeat and do the same thing and I just want to win, win, win because I have the best reverse punch and farm kick in the country? No, growth is expanding the knowledge base so you can be more well-rounded and be educated in that, in that area of education. So let, let's concentrate on that for a little bit. I think it's fascinating. We know that there are martial artists who have done the same thing. You fill in the X for the time period. It could be 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And they've done the same thing in an attempt to perfect what they were doing. And then there were other martial artists like myself and certainly like you who said, well, now, wait a minute. If I'm doing the same thing over a period of time, by definition, that means that I'm probably not growing. And so my question for you is, does growth in the martial art, does that also portend difficulty? Is it hard to grow? Is it painful to grow? And because that might be the case, people shy away from it. The more you're willing to adjust and, and question yourself as far as your growth is concerned, the harder it becomes. It's a difficult decision. But we go on the basis, well, if I, if, if I do this technique 
thousands and thousands of times, I can perfect that technique. That's a fallacy. Perfection is that very thing that has a touch of imperfection, imperfection okay? That's a philosophical concept that has existed since time. So we kind of talking about uh, great experiences that you've had in the martial art, and you've talked about Kumite. We really did drill down quite a bit on the evolution of martial arts. Can you give me some of those experiences that you thought were great experiences that are associated with things like instructing young students, sometimes guppies as we call them? Uh, yeah, the guppies, don't you love them? Well, that's an exciting time, okay? I, uh, we have a responsibility when we accept those youngsters into our programs, we take on a responsibility that is compared to the parent because they have certain values, certain standards, certain considerations that they want instilled in their children. And we have to have an understanding of what those parents are seeking. And we have lots of statements that we make, but how are we, inf how are we infiltrating the standards that they seek through the martial arts and meeting that standard, because it comes to, we have to have a standard to go by. And so we look at the parents to meet that standard, not necessarily on how the parents themselves were raised or where they are in their life now because of their incapabilities, but because they recognize their shortcomings and they've come to us to help reinforce what they feel is positive, constructive information that would better their child and help them go further in life than they have. So I want to ask about uh, Hachi George Anderson. And um, you had significant interactions with, with Mr. Anderson. And I guess fundamentally what I'd like to know is how did he influence you as a martial artist? Oh, wow. Uh, very deeply. He influenced me by his unique method of always asking you questions. And the wonderment of him is that he would ask many questions that he obviously already knew the answer. But these questions sometimes were questions that were falsehoods. Can you give me an example? Ah, uh, that's going to be hard to do right now. Okay, I'd okay. have to think on that. But it's like things that he would ask. Um, he may take a historical concept to a style, okay, and say, this style does this, this, and this. And he knows darn well they don't. Now, you're saying that you've studied martial arts and you've studied other styles. Do you really understand it? We're supposed to understand the four major styles. Now, well, can I answer that question the way he wants it or is it a question that can't be answered? He would do that all the time. Yes, he would, constantly, he would. okay? Yeah. He wanted to motivate you to think. Okay, he wanted us to be intellectually capable of thinking for ourselves because he knew it's going to have to be carried on. So we could pass that on to the multitudes of students that we interacted with, the same basis. Because if you can't think, what can you do? So you're Hunchy Wilcox, but you are also Dr. Wilcox. Yes. And so I'm asking Dr. Wilcox, Anderson's uh, methodology of doing that thought provocation, is that a little bit of a take on the Socratic method? I think so, yes. Yeah, I, th I, th I think so too. And I think a lot of students, some found it fascinating. Uh, some students, uh, to be quite honest, never quite got it. Uh, but then so some students are still trying to answer some of the questions today uh, that he posed to them. Well, he would pose a question like, what comes before the beginning? <laughs> that's right. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That's, you know, how do you quantify that question? Okay. Yeah. How do you quantify the answer? There's many ways we can do that. We can go to the Bible and utilize the relationship to God. If, if uh, 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 that is one area, we can, what became before the beginning of what? Okay. That would be my response. Sometimes he would ask me questions, and I said, I'm not playing this game today, George. <laughs> right. Okay. But, you know, the beginning of what? Okay. The beginning of the universe, the beginning of life, the beginning of an opportunity. Okay. Or was he really talking about the beginning of thought? 
Well, um, these are the kinds of things that had left many a martial arts student, myself uh, included, uh, perplexed uh, at the complexity of his questions. Um, but again, uh, the goal was to provide some level of, of thought provocation to make you think about different approaches to different things that he would ask you, which is fascinating. Yes, he would plant a direction intellectually that he's already paved or for you to continue paving, okay? And to learn the importance of asking these type of questions that will stimulate the intellectual thought that man has and not restrict yourself just strictly to the concept, I'm a linear thinker. Okay, now the linear, the process of linear really is I have everything in order, but it's applying from where I'm coming from. A linear thinking is someone who's restricting their thinking process. It may be in order, but it has great limitations. And that was not what he was after. He paved the road, but he wanted to pay, he wanted us to pave the, 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 road sides, okay, like a tree, okay, he planted the tree, but he wanted us to understand the growth of the branches, okay, and my feeling on that aspect is that he did, he, he had a process of teaching and providing information, but he didn't want to be restricted by one formula, period, okay, as a, a, a syllabus, he didn't want to be restricted by a syllabus, because his feeling overall, from my perspective and my interaction, was that the martial arts really is flexible. And it has to be flexible with the intellect so we can continue to learn and grow. So do not restrict yourself to one specific style. If you do, allow the style to be that that has movement within itself for growth. That's how I perceived it. And, and personally, I, I thought that was one of the hallmarks of his philosophy, was to be able to say there are standards. However, within the standards, there are flexibilities. Right. Uh, and he was a master at that kind of synthesis. Is, is, so it brings us to a, a present day question. Um, where do you think the martial arts are today? I think martial arts, as a whole, are in a very complex situation. We have open tournament, which is run by multiply groups around the country, but they're still individuals. But it's an open tournament basis. There's, there's the standards are totally different than what we have as an Olympic movement. But when we look at any other activity, because it's gone to a sport mentality, we look at any other sport. Baseball's played by the same rules in the Little League, in the local Sandlot baseball, as you are in professional baseball, as you are in collegiate baseball. So there's a process that's followed from the beginning. We do not necessarily have that in the martial arts sporting world, okay? They're trying to build that, but show me where the grassroots program is. Show me where we have in local communities where they're running by the same rules and regulations. Okay, hi. The same standards for safety, the same standards for scoring, okay, the same standards for training. Now that doesn't mean there are not other ways to train and do these things, but it doesn't give us a cohesive activity that's really a sport as a whole. It's a fragmented basis. So when we talk about where martial arts are today, my secondary question is, how much of sport represents the future of martial art? You just elucidated what some of the problems were, but there are many things in the martial arts world that exist outside the realm of sport. So where do we, where do we see, where are those things? What's the state of the art of, of the things that lie outside of sport? That's really a complex question. The process, as I see it, is that we have to integrate the process of developing modifications of the old into what we see as the new, okay, at all levels, in which can be accepted socially. Okay. Martial arts as I know it, or I was 
exposed to it initially has evolved in a different direction. We need to get back to the fact when I first started martial arts, I started jujitsu. In what, what year? 1957. Okay. I did not know anything about Bankai, but that was a karate thing. I never knew. I mean, there's Bankai in jujitsu, obviously, but I didn't know anything about kata. I never heard of kata. I actually, I never even heard of karate in 1957. I had no idea. It was until early 60s that I found out there was a karate. And what was going on then was from a business standpoint. Okay, not necessarily, I see, I look at some, we have businesses that are teaching, but the businesses are not, have to make money, but a lot of them are designed for ego of the individual that owns that school, and they're not really concerned about the student body. And until we get, and we have that in education as well, unfortunately, but until we get a level playing field across the board, like we, and I don't like government involved necessarily, but like driver's license. We need to have our standards set to a place that six-year-olds cannot be black belts. Twelve-year-olds should not be black belts. They may learn all the materials, but are they psychologically and emotionally developed to conduct themselves appropriately as an adult? Because becoming initially a black belt was that of becoming a man, and you start at a certain age rather than six years old. But six years old, seven years old, you can burn a child out. So we have to find a way to lure them in, if I can use that loosely, okay, at a little older age and not such a young age. But if we do, we have to have a program that is contributing to them in their education and family values. So they, we can create this, make sure there's personal standards outside the dojo are achieving the goals that we have. Like how many failings have we had in football and baseball and sports of the ramification of falsehood or manipulation of grades, just so we, the athletes can play. Um, what have we really given the athlete? We've taken away from them. We've misled them, okay? We've lied to them. And we need the arts if it wants to meet the standard that we talk about building character, okay? We need to have that sound, sound foundation on a local level. But see, the guy across the street that's not here in this interview that works in an office as a clerk, if he wanted to right now, he can go down the street and open up Joe Howie Hustle's new school of martial arts. Okay, And there's no restriction to him. And what's he going to teach? Whatever creates fun and frolic for the youngsters so he can make money. But he's not really teaching martial arts. He's not building character. And they, they have to mesh together. You shouldn't separate the two. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that we do not build a individual that has the ability to defend themselves, but that goes into a different type of training. And we should not create the falseness with martial artists that they're capable of defending themselves when they've never been in an altercation. They've never been out on the street. So can, can we say there's a differentiation between sport or sport martial art and the other aspects of martial art that are more akin to self-defense actual ori orientation or, or those kinds of encounters? There's a difference between the sport and actual fighting, actual personal survival okay. and it has it should be a whole package it shouldn't just be punch and kick it should be body control body cr crashing okay which you happen today in your seminar happen to use okay body crashing I believe in it creates a lot of advantages when you're able to do that okay it opens up a lot of avenues but the, the people that study need to know the difference the children that are taught they're learning sport it has to be identified that they are learning sport. The word self-defense is used too freely. Just because you know how to punch and kick does not know, mean you know how to defend yourself. Because you're, you're, you're fighting the opponent and the thing is you don't want to stand three paces away from each other and bang it out like a boxer, like a pugilism, okay? That's not what martial art is. Martial art is close up and unfriendly. 
in self-defense. On a highly friendly note, I would like to say thank you for your time today, Hanchi Wilcox. I'm, I'm certain that the listeners will enjoy the insights that you've provided and thank you for uh, concluding this episode of the Quan Moon Monologue. Thank you for being here. Well, it's been a privilege. Thank you very much, Ron Layton, Dr. Ron <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.